Hey, it's Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And it's time for part three of the series, my top 50 games of all time from 30 to 21. I think that's how it works. And starting us off the bat, we're going to have Super Fantasy Brawl, which hopefully will not fall completely down everywhere. Do we have a back of the box here? We do. Look at that back of the box. That's a pretty back of the box. And so if you haven't watched already the first two in the series, I'm doing my top 50 games of all time. 50 through 41 were two weeks ago. 40 through 31 was a week ago. And now 30 through 21 is today. Today, surprisingly, because today. And Super Fantasy Brawl is going to be nine number 30. This is going to be one of my both in the category of the games that are new to me this year, as well as the Kickstarter games on this list. I have roughly, it keeps changing because I realize what isn't isn't Kickstarter, but I have roughly 17 games in my top 50 of all time that are Kickstarter, roughly 12, I think it was, 12 games that are new to me, period, in 2020, and then I think four from 2020 that are new to me. This one is going to check all those boxes. It is a 2020 game and is new to me in 2020, inherently, and it is a Kickstarter game. This is one that is by Mythic Games, uh, designed by Johan Eisenhuth, I believe that's how you say it, I could be wrong, and this is going to be a skirmish game, a two-player head-to-head skirmish game with a, you know, variant for team play or whatnot. It's one that I do have a uh, review on as well, and it is a game that has been an absolute delight to add to my collection. It is fast-paced attacking action, skirmishing, heroes' abilities, leveling up your character. Well, that's not true. You don't level up any characters, but you actually, it's not true. You do. You do kind of level up your characters a little bit mid-game, although it doesn't really last so long. Honestly, that's one of the parts of the game I wish were a little better developed in what it does. It's kind of is in the game without being super impactful, but it is there. It does have an impact, but ultimately you're trying to achieve various trophies in order to get to five points before your opponent does. You can kill your opponents to get a point. You can uh, uh, you can complete certain trophies to get between one and two points for those trophies. First to five wins the game. Game comes in at roughly 30 to 45 minutes. Drafting your heroes, picking your team, and going full force at each other's throats is a lot of fun in this game. I've really enjoyed my plays of Super Fantasy Brawl. I will hopefully continue to enjoy my plays of Super Fantasy Brawl, and that that is why it is my number 30. From there, we have my 29. And before we get into my 29, which is going to be Watergate, before we get into it, this is a good time to talk about something I mentioned in the last video, and it's going to be true here as well. It's hard to order these games, and I tried ordering these games based on what I think they do, how well they are at what they are trying to do. But there are some games, especially on this list, that I can't imagine picking one over the other, and yet I still am ranking them the way they are, especially party games or games that are lighter in nature. I tend to not love quite as much as heavier games, but if they are that good at what they do, they still will find a place in their list, which basically is a way of saying that I have a list, it has a weird order, and sometimes I still like other games more than other games, but they're still in the order that they are in. And from there, we're going to go to Watergate. Watergate is a two-player, again, another two-player game here. In fact, there's a decent amount of two-player games on this on this particular segment over here. And solo, too. This is a good solo and two-player list, and other stuff. But Watergate. Watergate is going to be put out by Capstone Games, designed by uh, Matt, 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 Matthias Kramer. Matthias Kramer. Matthias, I don't know how to say his name. Matthias Kramer. Uh, Watergate is going to be a game that is a two-player head-to-head game set in the Watergate uh, scandal of whatever, of the presidency, Nixon and all that. And it really does capture that tense back and forth. As Nixon, you're trying to kind of lock down people who will provide any form of assistance or reporting or telling or whatever it is to leading to that paper trail that the press is trying to discover. And as the press, you're trying to find that paper trail, still connecting the dots between people who know what's going on and between ultimately tying those people to Nixon. It is ultimately a game of tug of war. I don't remember if I have a full review of this game. I don't remember. I may or may not have done a full review of Watergate. If I haven't, well, you should definitely get your hands in this one. It's a two-player head-to-head tug-of-war game that is more than the sum of its parts. It's more than simple tug of war. It it really has a lot of tenseness. It's card driven. It's going to be card driven kind of similar to Twilight Struggle or games in that genre in the sense that both players have an asymmetric deck of cards and abilities that will drive the core game mechanisms towards whatever you're trying to do. The game works incredibly well. We have found it personally in our limited plays to be incredibly well balanced. A solid game. Thoroughly enjoying this one. Need to play it more. I need to play all my games more, but that just is what it is, and that is my number 29. Number 28 is going to be our next, but not our last, two-player game, and this is going to be the Game of Tack. This is a game designed by James Ernest and Patrick, Patrick Rothfuss. It's from the book series In the Name of the Wind. They mentioned the game Tack in that series, and then from there they went on to actually design a board game around it. A board game that not only is passably good, but is, in my opinion, amazing. This is my favorite abstract game of all time. I'd have to go through the rest of my top 
25-ish games, whatever it is, but I'm pretty sure I do not have any abstracts rated higher than TAC. I think TAC is my favorite abstract of all time, beating games like Yinch, like Tsar, like Chess, which, I mean, I like Chess. Chess is great. Watch the Queen's Gambit. Great show. Great show. I would love to see the Queen's Gambit with TAC. That would be, I mean, it would be the same exact show, just with a different game at the core, but nonetheless, in any case, TAC is a a great abstract game that, to me, it it blends the... I would say with abstracts, abstracts are a fun concept. We have abstracts that are older in nature, that are games like chess, checkers, all those, you know, ancient abstracts that have been around for decades. And then we have newer games that try to put a fun new twist on things. And the GIFT series, Yinch, Star, Dvon, all those will to a certain extent fall into that category. TAC to me manages to perfectly blend those worlds. It is a new game that feels like this could be a game that is hundreds years old. You could tell people that, yeah, they recently discovered this and it's been played in Persia for the past two centuries. People would believe you. It would make sense. This game is elegant, beyond elegant, and yet works so well. Ultimately, you're trying to get a line of pieces from your side to the opposing side. It doesn't have to be a straight line, just to be connecting two sides of the board with your pieces. And yet the way the game allows you to get in each other's ways and the slow escalation of the game and the way you can add different pieces, it almost feels a little bit like the the Oniverse series in the way that the game has, here's this basic concept, here's the next layer with blockers, and here's the next layer with their capstone and blockers and everything else. It gives you an incredible experience, one that is a, a blend between getting in your win against your opponent realizing it versus you can play with check rules. You can be like attack and then you know warn someone you're about to win and they have to try to figure it out and it only comes down to the double trap there are so many different ways to play this game it is incredibly rewarding by far my favorite abstract unless of course i realize later that there's another abstract that i put on this list that i totally forgot about but for now it's my favorite abstract number 30 i always am bad with numbers number 30 29 28 27 number 27 this is why having a sheet of paper strapped to the camera sometimes helps number 27 is going to be lost runes of arnak this is one that is another 2020 game that is new to me in 2020, not a Kickstarter. So filling two of those slots, not filling the third. And Lost Wounds of Arnak, let's put it over here. Lost Wounds of Arnak is going to be by CGE, designed by Min and Elwin, and this is going to be one of those worker placement deck building games. It is a solid, solid game. I have thoroughly been enjoying uh, Lost Wounds of Arnak. I've thoroughly been enjoying the the gameplay of, of building up your deck, going to different key locations, doing all that in roughly a 45 minute play time while trying to achieve more and more. My biggest critique against the game is I constantly feel that I just kind of want one more round in the game. I want to get a little bit more done. Moving up those, like, especially that side track where you're moving up your magnifying glass and your journal to try to get some bonuses. I feel that if you go full on on that track, you can't get like anything else done in the game but you kind of I, I kind of want to go full up on that track and so I keep feeling like I want one more round in the game but that being said I, I haven't played this as much as I possibly could and so maybe I'll just get better at it and that will work or maybe I'll just add a fictional sixth round the game would work perfectly fine if I choose to do so I haven't felt the need to do so but I, I keep being tempted Lost Wins of Arnak is a game that I already want an expansion for the game is is solid don't get me wrong you can play this game for quite a bit without needing the expansion as I as I have there's a lot of cards that you don't see them every single game you're deck building throughout there's artifacts there's cards there's different options pathways to victories all that stuff works well with i have not played it solo works well with two three or four players i can say that much my ideal player count it's hard i would say i like it a little bit more with three but two is a shorter more accessible game time so it's it's hard in that sense in terms of measuring which one I like most. Four is probably my worst. It adds more downtime without adding any real extra degree of player interaction that I feel is rewarding enough. Uh, it's one, like I said already, I, I want an expansion. I want it now, not because it needs it, but because I feel this game, first of all, more cards and deck builders are always a good thing or almost always a good thing. And then I just, I, I feel like there's a little bit more I kind of want to do or get done or all those things. Ultimately, Lost Wings of Arnak is one that I incredibly recommend. I hope to see this on many other people's top games of 2020 list for me this one knocked it out of the park i had played endless winter first because i played the prototype for the kickstarter and then i heard about this other deck building worker placement game coming from cg and i was like oh another one i mean i love endless winter we'll try this one but i can't imagine it'll be that good it'll probably be a little bit okay whatever and it blew me away i still prefer endless winter but like marginally marginally i prefer endless winter and of course endless winter isn't available so spoiler alert it will not be on any of the following games for this list moving on from there 
We have 26, I believe. And this is going to be CGE again, Under Falling Skies by CGE. This one was not on my radar at all. In fact, uh, Lost Moons of Arnak, like I said, because of that deck building worker placement, I was incredibly interested in. Under Falling Skies, I was barely interested in. I saw the artwork, it looked interesting. It said one plus, I was like, oh, I'll get a nice co-op game. Turns out it's not really a co-op. I mean, you could play it cooperatively, but I personally would recommend it solo. And I was like, oh, this is more of a solo game. Okay, I mean, I don't mind solo games. I don't play them as often as I'd like to, because I find the setup and time and all that, I, I try to double up on my time. And so playing a game with my wife, with my friends, is both game time and social time. Playing solo games for the sake of reviewing them is doubling up on channel time as well as solo time. Playing solo games for themselves, I find has to be either, just it has to be such a good game for me to be willing to devote pure alone time for something that isn't helping the channel, isn't helping social, it's just pure gaming. And so I don't have a problem with that, I just don't do it as often as I'd like, despite having a bunch of solo games that I should play more. But there are exceptions. Exceptions would include Terraforming Mars, which is so much fun solo. Spirit Island, which is incredible solo. Mage Knight in theory, but it's just so much time to play Mage Knight. And then games like Sprawlopolis, which is so accessible and easy to pull out. The Oniverse, and now... Under Falling Skies joins the ranks of those incredibly easy, accessible board games to pull out. If you like the Oniverse, if you like Sprawlopolis, if you like being presented with a puzzle in a, a short 20 minute playtime that you can just get to the table, knock out three or four games, have a blast, better this than a video game, although if you like video games, nothing wrong with video games. But Under Falling Skies is immensely enjoyable. You are basically controlling, uh, you're not controlling, you're trying to fight back against an alien invasion of your planet as ships slowly descend upon Earth on Area 51, New York, Boston, whatever city you're in. And you have to manage how to fight back, how to research their weaknesses, how to stop them from taking you down. And you have to do all that. But the problem is, the better your dice are, the higher your dice are, the better they are for you, the higher your dice are, the faster the enemy ships move, and you have to time your attacks, your pushbacks, against them perfectly. That that puzzle that it presents, and the slow escalation, it gives you a campaign that you can play through. I've only played through the first of the first one of four campaign sections of the game, and it's just so much fun. You don't need the campaign, but, I mean, hey, it's a bigger box because it gives you more stuff, and I don't have a problem with more stuff. This is one that I will, of course, buy every single expansion they come out with, but I can't say I feel the need for it quite as much. The the experience it gives me already is incredibly satisfying. And from there, we go down to, again, just give me a second, 30, 25, my 25th highest game of all time as I reach over realizing that was too far out of reach is going to be Sprawlopolis. Speaking of solo games that I really enjoy, and in fact, now it's, it's hard to know. Looking at these two together, you know what? I'm going to let Sprawlopolis keep the win because I have played this significantly more than Under Falling Skies. So in terms of my ranking, I will keep Sprawlopolis higher. I would not be surprised if there's a pivot, an overthrow next year as to which one I enjoy. But the flip side is Sprawlopolis also fits in my pocket, which does give it a degree of accessibility that Under Falling Skies does not. And so I don't know which one will be higher next year, but from this year, we'll leave Sprawlopolis higher on the list. Sprawlopolis is a delightful little solo puzzle game, similar to the idea of why I play Under Falling Skies as to why I enjoy that. In Sprawlopolis, you have a little deck full of cards. It's all this game is. It's from Button Shy Games, a little deck full of cards that you can sit there and try to figure out how to optimize, optimize your way towards victory. You're going to be given three scoring condition cards that tell you how to score that particular puzzle. And then you'll play the cards out onto the table, slowly but surely building your city, trying to fulfill those different criteria and ultimately either win or lose. It comes with a basic mode as well as an advanced mode. I recommend the advanced mode once you, once you're winning enough of the basic mode, the advanced mode provides, I think, a perfect level of challenge to the game. The basic mode is good for when you're jumping into it, but you will hopefully quickly outpace the complexity of, of that with the additional scoring opportunities that it provides. But I love the puzzle Sprawlopolis provides. This is one that I would, I mean, honestly, the expansions, this one kind of has expansions in it. I'm not really such a huge fan of them. I would rather they just give me more scoring cards, not like changes in the rules. I don't care about that. I would just love having double the scoring cards, new variabilities, new configurations, new ways. Uh, that being said, they did just have a quick starter for Agripolis or whatever it is, which I, of course, backed, as which gave you both Agripolis, which is a own newer version of Sprawlopolis and can be combined with Sprawlopolis. So I guess if I wanted more scoring cards and criteria, I got something. We'll see exactly how that plays out. I assume it'll be good. It's, it's Sprawlopolis just with farms. I prefer the cities, but I'll take I'll take both. And from there, we go to my number 24. I want to say 24. Yes. Yes, 24. My number 24 game is going to be Kemet. And you see, this is where we start getting to that weird spot of how... I don't know how to really reconcile the idea that I'm putting 
certain games higher than other games. But anyways, we'll, we'll get back to it in a second. There's lower games on this list. But Kemet, Kemet is a game that is incredibly enjoyable. This is going to be part of the Kemet, uh, Cyclades, Innis trilogy of games. I have a review of Cyclades that just went up recently, I think, or is going up shortly. One of those two, for sure. I'll eventually do a review of Kemet and Innis as well. Basically, I'm slowly going through my entire collection to review all the games that I have failed to review because I've been in board games for eight years, nine years, and I've been in, you know content creation for a year, so there's plenty of time to catch up on all my favorite games, but Kemet is my least favorite, spoiler alert, of the of the trilogy, and yet is still an incredible game, obviously, if it's my number 24 game. This is one that it powers and abilities drive that game forward. In Kemet, you are going to be presented, let's assume base game Kemet for a second, you're going to be presented with three tiers of powers, either economic powers that will increase your monetary might or whatever, uh, defensive powers that are blue, that will give you all these different bonuses that will increase your ability to survive to do well, to potentially get victory points in defensive battles, which usually you don't get. And then finally, aggressive tiles that are red that will drive forward in terms of instant kills, additional blood, additional strength, additional things that just drive home your pure military might in this game. And you go for those different powers because no single tree of power will win you the game. It's usually going to be the combination of which one you are most powerful in, and then which ones you dabble into different degrees in whatever way helps your engine, helps you grow. Having a little bit in everything can often be the way to go in this game. Kemet is so ridiculously satisfying in the different ways you can build those trees out, the different powers and abilities that you can use to drive home for the win. And every single game of Kemet, I find there's always room to try new things, to try new strategies, to try new experiments the ways the powers combine and then add the expansion into the mix and it's even more stuff that you can try to mix in in terms of how you're going to min max that those powers and abilities and not just the powers and abilities in the engine you are building but then the tactical decisions you make along with those powers and abilities because in Kemet it's not important when you lose it's important how and when you win understanding when to push when to pull when to withdraw when to just go in for a sudden victory and not worry about the consequences because ultimately you're going to walk away with two extra victory points that you didn't have before and and you can recover and retreat from whatever punishment they eat back out you. There's so much to do in Kemet, so much strategy and decisions. There is a new Kickstarter, Kemet Blood and Sand, that I did back because I am curious to see whether they fix some of the, the end game stuff in Kemet because Kemet does have a first player or a last player problem. The last player in turn order does have a little bit of an advantage, especially when you go towards that end game and combine that with some powers that will combine, like teleporting all across the board, jumping from location to location to sweep in a last minute win. There are some small little bugs, so to speak, in this game, which honestly, I'm surprised surprised there aren't more considering the vast number of powers that are just completely ridiculously overpowered except everything is overpowered and so nothing is overpowered and that is why Kemet is my number 24. My number 23 is going to be codenames, not codenames, my number 23 is going to be Chaos in the Old World, another C. Chaos in the Old World designed by Eric Lang, put out by Fantasy Blood Flight. This is the Warhammer game of blood and combat and who knows what. This is a solid, solid game in the area control genre of games, of which I have a lot, a lot coming, because it is one of my favorite genres. And Chaos in the Old World, to me, there are so many things that I like about Chaos that are just different than the other games. The way you play cards to different locations, because the driving force of Chaos is to win through either of a few options, because you each have your own, you're, you're trying to advance your character dials, each of these gods have their own unique character conditions to win. The game is asymmetric to a, de to a degree, the main core is the same, but the way each player interacts with the game is slightly different, the each player's competitive advantage is slightly different, that asymmetry is fun, and adding the Horned Rat expansion to the mix is even more fun, gives you more asymmetry, plus allows for a fifth player game, and this game does work well with four and five players. In my opinion, it does not work well with three or fewer. But in the game, so you have these asymmetric gods, and each one has their own way of advancing the dial. If you get your dial towards the end, you win. Alternatively, you get 50 points, you win. Not all characters are created equal in their ability to do well on either or both of those. Some of them are better at one or the other, and you have to play the game as much as the game state, as much as the other players. But in the game, you're driving towards that end game, and a lot of that's going to have to do with the cultists you have, when and where you try to use them to add, add rune to different regions on the board. And knowing how to play different cards to different zones, because each zone has spots for two cards. Once two cards are placed, that's it. No more cards in that zone. And so playing cards to zones not only locks in something different and special and magical about what's going to happen there that you have caused, but it also limits your opponent's abilities to go there. And so playing the first card to a zone is already a bit of a 
a move, a push, you know, advancing your pawn forward, so to speak. Playing the second card to his own locks in the game state. It changes how that battle is going to fight throughout the rest of the round. And then slowly adding characters to different spots on the board to take advantage of how the cards are being played, the characters are being put out, understanding where and when to sp spend to spend your power, your rage power. I think rage is blood rage. In this game, it's power. And spending that to both put out cards, put out units, and ultimately drive home towards a victory where you hopefully win in this game. Chaos in the Old World has so many things going for it. For me, one of my favorite things is just adding in all the cards from the expansions because it just gives you more. As soon as you feel like you have a grasp of the game, a grasp of the cards, all you have to do is add in those expansion cards. And it's just, it gives you so many different ways to mix up what may have become a stale genre for your group. I would argue that the Horned Rat expansions while adding the fifth character is a huge addition to the game, and I do think you should get it if you have the game and like the game, I would argue the additional cards the Horn Rat expansion gives you is just as impactful in the way it will mix up and change your experience of this game. Different player powers, different cards, just new different stuff, because everyone already has their own asymmetric upgrade deck, their own asymmetric deck of cards, their own asymmetric of faction abilities, units, a slight differences, not as asymmetric as Root. This is not a game where you're going to have to explain four different ways of playing the entire game. You have to explain one way of playing the game and then how each faction has their own competitive advantage and driving force towards the way that faction will win the game. And then coming in from there at our number 22, we have One Night Ultimate World Daybreak. And again, I understand, I understand very well the crime of, of picking a game like One Night Ultimate World Daybreak over a game like Chaos in the Old World. If I had to pick one of these games, I would probably pick One Night Ultimate World Daybreak though. And the reason for that is because to me, One Night Ultimate Werewolf is, and Day Day Daybreak's just, you know, whatever. It's just the One Night Ultimate Werewolf brand or whatever it is. To me, One Night Ultimate Werewolf is the best hidden role game I own, which I will roll some eyes from some people as it is, but more to the point that I have a lot of area control games. I have a lot of games that compete with chaos in the space that they are in. And so given an absolute vacuum of no other games in my collection, I would choose Chaos over One Night Ultimate Werewolf. I would rather experience Chaos than One Night Ultimate Werewolf. But given the fact that my collection is not in a vacuum, given the fact that I'm constantly choosing between all different criteria, to me, I would rather have the best hidden role game that I own stay in my collection and the fun and hilarity that ensues. I'll talk more about the game in a second. Because I have many other games that compete with Chaos for how fun they feel in that space. And that's why I feel always challenged with the orderings of these lists where I'm like, I can't pick this over this, but I but I am today. One Elf Mower of Daybreak is going to be, like I said, my favorite social deduction game. This is one that very much depends on the group you are playing it with. I have played this with people who have made this a horrible experience. I have played this with people who made it an okay experience, and I have played it with my game group, where it has been an absolutely amazing experience. And one of the things I love about this game is the way I, I explain this to people is this is like throwing a wall of, of like throwing spaghetti truths at the wall and seeing what actually sticks because you'll be constantly throwing statements at each other of what happened what did happen what happened throughout the night what role did i switch whose car did i steal what did i start off as what did i end up as what in any way went on who all the things all the different characters and the roles they bring to the table you'll be telling your friends what you did and didn't do during the night and then slowly but surely, a narrative will evolve from those statements. A narrative will evolve where you'll start to realize, wait, you said you're the troublemaker and you switched those two cards, but you couldn't have done that because I was the insomniac and I still woke up as the insomniac. And now will I call you out on that because, you know, just eliminating one potential thing from the pool? Or will I go along with a lot to see how it plays out? You're constantly trying to see what will make the most sense to announce, when to announce it, to what degree of truth to announce it, and slowly but surely a narrative will evolve and you will hopefully be the person that is following it correctly. Because understanding that you're good or not good is not the point in this game. The point in this game is to understand whether you are still good or not good. Which team have you ended up on? What is your current objective criteria to win this game? That is so much more important than knowing what happened initially. Knowing what happened throughout the night will really drive home how you win. And once you have that thread of truth, that's when you want to draw the rest of the table around your reasoning to, in some way, ideally make you win. If you're a werewolf, you want to drive them around some sort of false thread of reasoning that it results in them not voting you out. And if you're a good guy, you want to drive them home around that reasoning. But the whole point is to find that thread of truth, follow it to its conclusion, and bring the rest of the table along with you or push them entirely off in a different direction, whichever makes the most sense for you. And I love it. And it does all that in six minutes of a game or five to seven minutes of a game that is immensely enjoyable, mixing up all the rules, consistently changing up the experience. This is a game that we have, I mean, this year alone, we had one particular game that we're for four hours straight 
we just played this again and again and again and again, enjoying it every single time. Uh, this is a game that I personally prefer most with, I would say, five and six players. At seven and eight, it starts to get a little bit more chaotic. Don't get me wrong, a lot of people do prefer it with seven and eight. For myself, I find it more chaotic at higher player counts and not enough n options at lower player counts. So for me, five to six is going to be my sweet spot. Four and seven is good. And then three and eight, I don't like nearly as much in either direction. And lastly on this list, my number 21, which I accidentally said already, is going to be Codenames Duet. And same logic applies. Same idea of, of One Out of the World. Codenames Duet versus Chaos in the Old World. This is a hard choice, but it depends on how you're grading a game in terms of being the best at what it's trying to do in your collection. And Codenames Duet, no question to me, is the best at what it's trying to do in my collection. It is the best uh, couples two-player game. It's the best little party game that is accessible to people who are both gamers and non-gamers alike. Codenames in general is going to be a solid spot in my collection, but Codenames Duet is the one that I find I have played far more over the years. I've played it significantly more because it, first of all, two players, which means I can play it with my spouse all the time. Secondly is this works with two, with, with both in two players as well as groups of people versus Codenames doesn't really work with less than four, fewer than four players. And especially this year, that's just, you know, having that large group of people playing a party game is just more and more the rarity these days. And Codenames Duet, it just, it gives you that Codenames experience in such a solid thing, laying out those cards, finding those clues. You may have noticed I talk about powers and abilities a lot, but I also talk about finding that thread, that puzzle. That's going to be true for Underfalling Skies, it's going to be true for Sprawlopolis, it's going to be true for One Night Ultimate World Daybreak, for Codenames Duet. The concept of finding the different criteria that you have been given and making them all work together to some sort of one cohesive method of winning the game. I like that in general in games. I like that concept. And Codenames Duet will certainly provide that in spades, that idea that you're given criteria and have to find the common thread. It's just, it literally is the game as opposed to the game disguised around that concept. I love finding a clue, an option on the table and being like, Agent 6, and then having people find and pick through, well, black, black, I mean, agents wear black, that seems right, okay, let's go with eight black, Moscow, because, you know, Russians and this and that, finding the different ways you can connect different things with a single word while avoiding both the death cards as well as the cards that aren't yours, I find it so rewarding. I also find it equally entertaining when the people at the table cannot in any way piece together, whether it's me as the clue giver or me guessing clues, trying to figure out what's going on in someone's head is immensely entertaining when you're wrong and immensely satisfying when you're right. Either way, Codenames delivers in spades at the experience it is trying to provide, which is why this is like my number one, I mean, if anyone's asking for any couples game recommendations, Codenames Duet is always my first pick to go to, just because of of how well Vladish Vatil has, has blurred those lines between mass gaming and, and strategy gaming in the entire Codenames universe, although not the entire Codenames universe, I actually do not like any of the, the Harry Potter, the Marvel, I don't like those ones, I feel they are not as well done. I don't mind the the theme or the branching out, I just don't feel that they are given the same proper attention rather than just slapping it on and sending it off into the world. And so that would be Codenames Duet. I like pictures, I like regular Codenames, I like Codenames Duet. I'm curious to see what else they will bring to the table. I really should get that just a lux deluxified giant XL version of Codenames because I do play this one enough. And that has been numbers 30 through 21. Stay tuned for next week where we'll do 20 through 20, 20 through 11 or whatnot. And then finally, of course, where we do 10 through 1, because that is how these top 10 lists or top 50 lists tend to go. As always, I am Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you enjoy this list. And as always, have a good one.